Welcome, I'm Jeff Cutmore in London, and for more on the investment outlook, I'm joined by Julian Rogers Coltman of the London and Oxford Group, and Neil Robson, Head of Global Equities for Columbia Threadneedle Investments. Gentlemen, welcome both. Uh, Neil, let me just start with you for a moment. Um, as we look at the opportunity through the rest of this year and into early 2020 now, how good is it for risk assets, do you think? Uh, I think potentially very good. Um, and the reason why, if you think back to where we were this time last year, the world in Q4 last year was fearing recession, trade problems, all those things were catalyzed. And it all changed in January when we had a much easier monetary policy. So that easier monetary policy is now feeding through. Um, inventory cycles and the likes of semis and so on have actually you know, gone through the lows we think now. And I think that will spread to other industries. Um, so I think we get rising industrial production into the middle of next year, um, possibly better than that if we get some sort of trade deal. And I think as a result of that, I think risk markets probably go quite well, especially with the Fed, which is very easy. One of the features of the recent trend, particularly in the US, is that we've seen money going back into value away from some of the higher growth technology companies. Yeah. Does that shift continue? Or does technology get another chance to pick up the baton and run with the momentum we've seen in recent years? Yeah, I, I'd almost um, think about bond yield sensitive. So if you think about the Austrian 100-year bond made you something like 75% through to the middle of August. Since August, it's lost you over 20% now. Um, if you remember 2017, when we had that 16 into 17, you had that acceleration in the economy. Actually, technology did very well and value did very well. What didn't do well was the bond yield sensitive type areas. So rather than paying 25 times for a utility, I think Google probably on 20, 21 times, growing earnings, revenues at 20% looks really attractive still. But I think there will also be some room for you know, chemical businesses, semiconductors, things like that, to do a lot better than they have in the last 12 months. Julian, how do you see the world from a, an asset allocation perspective? So I think it's coming towards risk on. I think Trump is uh, talking the talk, but as yet to walk the walk. So I think it'll be really interesting to see with the election looming next year exactly how he positions himself on that, because he's got the balance between a slowing economy, driven by his rhetoric, or the rhetoric, which is meant to improve the economy in the long term. But guess what's going to win? Short term. So my view is that he'll be toning that down and it'll be risk on. The technology story has been fascinating because it, it feels as though this year we've begun to see some real discernment among investors between businesses that um, have a, an unprofitable business model but are cash magnets or have been capital magnets and those that clearly have a proven model and are doing quite well in this environment. As we move into next year, is that discernment going to increase or is there an opportunity still for some of the unicorns that want to come to market to raise capital? Well, again, I think it's, it's a, that's a, a symptom of risk off, is that those swimming naked get discovered and we work would be a good example of that. Risk on tends to pull the tide back in, so, so those with sort of lesser capabilities might be able to disguise that for a while. Having said that, I think quality businesses are always out and time uh, is a great lever. So, so in effect, you'll find those businesses that will never make money will fail. And is the broad macro backdrop going to be supportive, do you think, running into next year? I mean, we've, yeah, we've, I, I we've had a Federal Reserve that's cut interest rates three times now and been quite aggressive. Everywhere else you look, Japan, Europe, the central banks are very supportive. And there's even some whispers that there may be some fiscal support at some stage. Yeah, so, so this is all related to QE wind down. Um, we've done a fair amount of that. It's going to continue, but at the pace is what defines it. So effectively, with you know, a, a slightly less aggressive QE wind down, you're going to find governments being, or central banks being cautious about bringing on recession. They're going to move that. They've had a bit of a fright, so they've just, as Neil said, moved back towards yeah. uh, sort of turning that down a tiny bit. Uh, I think there are obviously outside factors. We mentioned Trump. Um, the oil price is interesting. So, so there's a the report out a couple of days ago saying that they were perceiving potentially a 50% rise in oil prices within 18 months. Mm. This is linked to bankruptcies in the Permian Basin, uh, little Im limited investment in new uh, production sources, and obviously growing demand, whatever the economies are doing. So, so you know, uh, developing countries are going to consume more oil. So that, that might be a risk. Uh, Neil, just to bring you back into this, um, 
a feature of, of the last few years has been this focus on the American consumer supporting the economy and driving earnings in mm. the United States, and that's allowed the U.S. markets to, to outperform. Um, we look at China, uh, and growth seems to be slowing, but at 6%, still, still looks reasonable. very respectable. Yeah. Yeah. So how do you view China in, in the context of um, asset allocation and opportunities there in around equities? I mean, we tend not to think about countries so much. Um, I mean, there is a country risk premium, and clearly the risk premium on China has gone up in the last 12 months because of all the trade rhetoric. Um, we think of businesses, um, and I think business is really important. You mentioned the U.S. consumers, what's held up the U.S. I think it's the business mix across there. It's the fact that the U.S. has a lot more technology companies across there that is a result of them growing earnings a lot faster than what is a very mediocre pace worldwide. I think when you look at China, I think really growing slower might be better for it because actually one of the problems of China in the last 10 years is too many people making capacity decisions. So you know, capacity utilization goes down and returns on invested capital go down. I think you're know, growing slower but more steadily, less capital allocation, less capital additions in the economy could actually result in perhaps better return on invested capital type businesses. And you mentioned uh, technology companies specifically. Um, obviously, there's been quite a variance yep. in the level of performance from some of these businesses mm. through this year. Yep. A much more uh, discerning investor, as, as we, we spoke about. Um, as you look at the in, in opportunity in those companies specifically, how do you choose winners? What are the, and what are the red flags for those to avoid? Um, we tend not to be very early stage, so we tend to avoid you know, the really early stage type companies. And the reason being is that you know, the monetization metrics just aren't there. So the WeWork you mentioned, um, at the moment the likes of Uber, etc. Uh, so I think what you go through is you go through phases where these companies just fail to monetize or have to, you know, meet their cash flow demands. And then you go through phases like Google did about five years ago, Amazon about six years ago, where these businesses start to grow within their capabilities and actually can get some positive operating leverage. And I think we've, you know, we went through that in the US maybe five, six years ago and have continued. Perhaps the last 12 months we haven't seen that so much in the US, but I think we're getting that back. You know, if you look at Alibaba's results last week, you know, you had near 40% revenue growth and EBITDA growing almost as fast, that, you know, rather than the pedestrian 10 to 15% that was there before. So I think, you know, you, you know, we mentioned WeWork or Uber or something like that, and you, you worry about the amount of capital that they can raise, actually they can change how they're running their business. They can That's stop bleeding a little bit less, more money in third markets or wherever. Essentially, it's got a flawed business model. <coughs> yeah. It doesn't matter how I, great you are. I think business that's people, right. If the business model's flawed, it's probably going Absolutely. to fail, unless you change it, of course. Yeah. But I think Whereas Uber, I think, has got a good business model, yeah. um, certainly in Rise. There's, there's threat to, from competition. We, there we've is. seen that. Yeah. We've seen new, new incumbents in the UK. But I mean, I think your point, really, Jeff, is, uh, Neil, is, is that you've got fantastic companies tipping into yeah. total domination. Yeah. And that's when things really start to happen. Yeah. So we've seen Amazon, and we can talk about the effect on the UK high street. I'm sure that's a global impact. Mm -hmm. uh, the same with Google, who else uses it, yeah. any other search engine than Google. I mean, there are great yeah. examples of where dominant technology companies uh, just you know, seal the deal. And, and you, I'm sure those are the companies you're investing in. And, and you know, big tech investors like and love those companies yeah. because that's the best place to be. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure in China, you're more expert than me on this. So you've got the likes of Baidu and Alibaba and, the, and Co, who are Tencent, who are just destroying their marketplace, or Absolutely. will do yeah. in an infinitely bigger, I mean, four times the size of the US market. So, mm. so that's going to be a really interesting space to invest. Well, well, one of the things that um, happened, I think, over this year is this uh, shift in the view that Chinese technology would somehow integrate with existing US technology and we'd end up with a globalized story where everybody is uh, competing relatively equally for the global citizens' money, eyeballs, time. The whole narrative around the trade war has made us rethink whether we end up with a splinter net or a different approach to technology in East and West. How do you synthesize that into an investment approach or theme? Well, I think if you look at the major companies we've just talked about, <clears throat> they're in two separate spheres anyway. They don't compete with each other. They're, yeah, protect, they're, they're protected the, effectively. Yeah, they? effectively. They can't compete. You know, Google versus you know, Ali, the Alibaba, it's just they're different businesses working in different spheres. Yeah. I guess really where we're talking about is the supply chain. 
So it's kind of the hardware semiconductor type supply chain. And realistically, you know, if you're Huawei and you're planning your business on the next 10 years, you, you've got to think there is a major risk there and that you want to change your, your supply chain. Mm -hmm. Likewise, if you're a, a US business implementing 5G, you know, your previous plans are now gone. Mm -hmm. um, so I think regardless of what happens on the trade resolution, um, I think your people, businesses planning the future will take a more conservative attitude and a, maybe a step back from globalization that they previously thought. Mm -hmm. And I think you've got to think about reshoring. Yeah. from China, you've got to think about com com competition within Asia, from Vietnam and Indonesia and places like for lower cost employment. Yeah. These, these are all going to impact China. China China's cost of labor is going up. Uh, they are going to have to respond to the climate emergency by effectively putting stronger and more rigorous controls around their mm -hmm. emissions. That's going to raise costs for them. So there's a whole bunch of things which are coming to affect China. That's fine. We've all lived with that. They're just becoming a more mature economy, to your point about you know 6% probably yeah. being the right rate of growth. But the idea of onshoring, it coincides a lot with what's happening with technology. Yes. You know, if you think that artificial intelligence enables you to make predictions more frequently and cheaper, yep. you can do more prediction, yep. which means that if you link that with your manufacturing base, you might want to change you know, the number of red dresses versus green dresses you're producing. Inditex does it very well already. Mm -hmm. You stick AI on that, and what you absolutely must have is short supply chains, which says that onshoring is a really good idea driven by technology. And it's probably going to bring, you know, to be competitive cost-wise, you're probably going to have to automate you know, the lines tremendously. I think automation is absolutely critical. Yeah. You know, every manufacturing business is, is looking at cost of labor versus robots. It's a very simple equation. Yeah. You work out the payback, it's 18 months, we do it, or less than that. And many times that happens. Yeah. I mean, there's, um, uh, there's a whole lexicon uh, of technologies that we're all having to uh, come to uh, terms with and try and figure out the relative merits of investing in them, 5G, AI, FinTech, um, autonomous vehicles, robotics, and so on and so forth. Are there any particular areas or businesses that stand out to either of you as in the near term, the greater opportunity? I, mean, I think all of those areas you've mentioned are very live thoughts for the next 10 years. Mm. I think what you need to do is make sure that you're seeing some degree of competitive advantage arrive for a business that they can actually gain market share, become profitable and thrive. So you look at automation, it's very easy to think of a business like Kaons making 60% operating profit margins, that's really easy to do. Mm. FinTech, much, much harder. Mm. It's very, very hard to actually see the investable FinTech models, for us at least, um, that you would prepare to risk clients' money in today. So that's all about a race to the bottom, isn't it? Yeah. Effectively, it's the same as flat screen televisions. I mean, 10 years yeah. ago, if you were investing in Samsung, you think, there's <coughs> a new technology coming through. Well, guess what? Everybody produces it. There's no barriers to entry. Prices get yeah. crushed. You lose money. And that's what happens in those types of environments. So I think you know, your job as a fund manager is to try and determine what's in which bucket, basically, yeah. because yeah. the reality is that technology will destroy margins and it will just take them out, and that's the whole point of it. But the benefits of that technology is where you want to be investing. I, I mean, the, the challenge is, is just assessing wh which is the right vehicle, if you'll pardon the pun, because yeah. you've mentioned Uber yeah. several times here, but as we recently looked at their quarterly earnings, they managed to destroy a billion dollars yeah. through the quarter, yeah. and that's probably and going to carry I must on say, for some we're, we're not invested in Uber currently. <laughs> yes. But I mean, you know, I think you know, the next 10, 15 years, I mean, I, I've got this silly ex example with Google and autonomous vehicles. So if you think the average price of a car in the States is 36,000 bucks, if Google actually produced the operating system for the car mm. and charged 3,000 bucks for it, they've taken roughly 80% of all automotive profitability and left behind an industry with huge capital employed and no profits, creating a business which if they got 3,000 bucks per car for every car produced around the world, mm. would give them $200 billion worth of revenues, probably a 50% margin at least, if not better, that's 100 billion of profitability, mm. which would be worth probably 1.5 eight trillion at their current multiples. Mm. So you know, that softwareization of every single industry, not just tech, I think is what's happening literally in every industry. I went to a, um, a smart building conference um, in Olympia the other week, and it's all about you know, sticking on that software layer, censoring every single thing inside the building to get drive you know, environmental efficiency, but also cost saving. And if you can't d produce that, and you're just gonna produce the old, you know, temperature gauge and things like that, you basically lost your business, you've lost your value add. And that's the trend in every industry for the next 10, 15 years. Yeah, the same in manufacturing. So, yeah. so I'm a director of a Welsh water business called Radnor Hills where we have, 
I don't know, 180 odd employees, minimum wage is going up, so that actually means we're going to look more at automation. We've completely automated the, 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 the clearing of the tanks as we're changing mixes for the soft drinks, etc. Uh, jobs go. Um, but our margins improve because we've made the investment, we've had the payback in a couple of years' time, and we can hit what we need to be, which is the lowest cost producer in that sector. Julian, I wanted to focus a little on something that you know particularly uh, well uh, about, and that's the idea of outbound Chinese investment sure. as well as inbound. Um, there is a view that the recent trade war has encouraged the Chinese to think about self-reliance and autarky and so a shift to home-produced chips and a shift to manufacturing technology through the the China manufacturing vision that'll focus on the domestic market. Have you observed any change in the way the Chinese business community now thinks about its engagement with the outside world. Any lack of appetite to own assets in Europe or in other markets because of that experience of the trade uh, debacle with the United States? I'd say quite the contrary, ignoring the trade debacle because that's a separate issue. Um, the Chinese, you know, from top down, have a policy of, of, of now acquiring businesses. I mean, historically, they're famous for, other, for stealing businesses, but now they're actually coming and they're buying businesses. Uh, and, and the UK is a good focus for that. I should just to talk about the UK as opposed to Europe generally, where there are, I was reading earlier, that 750 uh, Chinese-owned businesses in the UK employ 80,000 people, turn over £70 billion, and range from football clubs to Huawei to all sorts of medical devices. So there's a, sort of an extremely wide range. And what they're doing here, effectively, is they're saying, okay, we can develop this ourselves, we'll take time, but actually why reinvent the wheel? We've got a checkbook, let's come and buy a British company. And in the time on a manner, starting with Ford Motor Company back in the 1920s of investing into this UK, building a British run, British developed, British with you know, all our wonderful technology skills and, and education resources and research resources here. Let's let's put money into this country and then take that technology back to China to accelerate our convergence with the US because that's what this is all about. It is about getting Chinese man on the street to the same level as the man on the street in America. So it's a gradual convergence. So this is a way of accelerating. And, that. and, and do you get that feeling that Europe has an opportunity here to attract that money? whilst there is this uh, ongoing disagreement between okay. Beijing and Washington. Yeah. I've had that directly from Chinese investors. We are investing here because Mr. Trump's being difficult. And there was a, um, a tendency a few years back for the Chinese to buy trophy assets mm -hmm. around the world and buy businesses that sometimes the ownership of seemed more to do with the personal ambition of the head of the company rather than good business logic. Has that changed now? Look, there's always going to be obvious examples like Thomas Cook where, you know, people get hoodwinked, frankly, into buying businesses they shouldn't be buying. Uh, and, you know, the Chinese are great learners. You know, they'd look at this, central government would look at that, and they'll say, that's pretty embarrassing. Let's do more DD before we put money into these businesses. But I think, you know, there are, there are some huge success stories in the UK uh, of Chinese ownership. Again, there's the same Grant Thornton report I was reading said that the 30 fastest growing businesses in Chinese owned in the UK, up 66% in turnover in the last two years. Um, you know, in 48 billion of, uh, of, of actual pounds turnover, Three and a half thousand employees. So you know these are these are significant investments into the UK and great for our economy. Neil, the the thematic, uh, uh, of course, has been you know focus on the domestic US investor when looking at opportunities in the US and do pretty much the same thing in China, whilst there has been this difficult mm. relationship. Um, do you agree with that argument that the if you want to get the safest best return on your money going into the Chinese economy look for businesses that are servicing the new middle class I mean that has clearly been true for the last 10 years um, and it will continue to be true I think um, I think the the Chinese capital markets are growing up gradually um, but I think you know the a share market is still you know there be dragons sort of thing it, you know, it is deemed as very risky um, and the way that changes is you know, better governance, better news flow, lower volatility, um, more sustainability um, type factors being considered. You know, as that gradually improves, and it will take a long time, I think that becomes you know, an, an obvious area for international money to flow to. 
as long as the business quality is good enough. Mm. Um, and I think you know, there is the possibility that that will happen, I think over a five to 10 year horizon. Um, I think you know, for US investors, in a way, they haven't had to venture outside their boundaries since the global financial crisis. You know, the US has been the best performing stock market. Um, I kind of suspect over the next year or two that might shift a little bit um, and become more balanced and there may be a little bit more reward to be had outside of their, their domestic market. Mm. And I, th I think Neil flags up some, some interesting challenges that have been there for the international investor for some time as they've looked at the Chinese market. Do you think a lot of those things are, are now um, issues that you can feel more comfortable with? The, the government has been on the front foot, it seems to me, about talking about technology transfers, talking about IP theft, talking about encouraging domestic companies to issue dividends and pay them. Do you feel positive about the direction well, that these stories I mean, are going? Know, joining the WTO was a big moment, because yeah. if you're part of that club, you have to obey the rules, and they've broadly done that, so that's obvious. Um, you know, I think, there, as, as Neil says, I mean, <laughs> having punted myself in Hong Kong stocks is always an element of risk, uh, and I don't think that's going to change in a hurry. So, so the, the, the right thing to do is either buy a China fund with somebody who knows what they're doing, or look at the bigger companies who, who possibly have overseas listings where, you know, the, by definition, they're, they're sort of wrapping themselves into a stronger regulatory re regime. You know, we have to remember Chinese uh, economy is centrally controlled. There are, there are sort of, you know, it's a different system to the one we're all involved in. We, we have to just, that's part of the risk premium you pay for, for investing in China. But it hasn't put people off. And, and I think that, you know, there remain significant opportunities. I mean, I mentioned earlier the sort of greening of the Chinese economy. I mean, we are leaders in Europe in, in terms of technologies relating to, to environmental change. They have, you know, gigantic climate emissions, 28% compared to our 1%. You know, so, so this is something they have to deal with. Yeah. They know they have to deal with. And I think that's a really interesting opportunity. Mm. I mean, in a way, you know, the Western world has basically exported our pollution yeah. to China. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's not their problem, it's our problem in a yeah. way. And it's all coming home well, to It's a collective risk. problem. Yep. Gentlemen, well, we'll wrap it on that moment of agreement between the two of you. Thank you so much for being with us for this uh, special program. Uh, and that's all the time we have for the moment. I'd like to thank our guests, Julian and Neil. And for those of you attending East Tech West, I'll see you there.